I love playing gambits in chess. But opponents are not always so cooperative by actually accepting the sacrificed material, which in many cases doesn't actually allow you to have the fun that you played the gambit to have. But not every gambit actually relies on your opponent accepting the sacrifice material to be fun. And this is certainly the case in the A3 Sicilian, which is possibly one of my favorite opening gambits, period. Brilliant opening. Uh, I couldn't recommend it highly enough, and so highly in fact, that I've linked a playlist below of a bunch of videos I've made that analyze games including the A3 Gambit in the Sicilian. So, I really hope you find that useful if you want to try the opening out for yourself. However, shameless plug aside, in today's game, my opponent, obviously, refuses to play into my Gambit line, but the nature of the opening even without sacrificing the material, creates such an interesting tactical game with opposite side castling, a brilliant move later on in the game that you've got to stick around to see, and maybe you can find it before I actually tell you. If that sounds like something you want to do, then watch the rest of the video, obviously, and let's get into the game analysis. All right, let's get into it. We have, obviously, the A3 Sicilian. And the point of this opening is to meet knight c6 or e6, which are by far the most common moves, with b5. And then after takes, 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 you play c3, attacking the knight, or if e6 is played and the bishop ends up on b4, take, attacking the bishop. And after the knight retreats or the bishop retreats, you play c3 and d4, take a massive center, and for the price of one pawn, you have full control over the central squares and the pawn that you've lost, well, you've lost an A pawn, basically, because you've traded B and C pawns. But losing the A pawn isn't so bad because this rook is now really active and a lot of the time, a piece, either a knight or a bishop, can end up on B5 and, it, and A6 is often completely ineffective because... The capture can't actually be made as, you know, your rook is open on the A-file. So it would just hang a rook as the pawn would be pinned. So that's the idea of the opening. My opponent, however, doesn't go knight c6 and doesn't go e6. He goes g6. And I've actually heard this be referred to as a refutation of the entire opening. And it's like, really? Because the idea is, b4 is now a stupid move, because bishop g7 and the rook is hit. Black takes advantage of the b-pawn moving and exposing the rook by forcing white to either play knight c3 or c3. I mean, rook a2 is a move, but who's going to play rook a2? And claim that white doesn't gain anything from this push and just wasting time while black's getting developed. But knight c3 is the typical move to meet g6. Because after bishop g7, bishop c4, knight c6, d3, this is a very common position you'll see all the time in this particular line of the opening. And the point is that white completely clamps down on the d5 push and tries to stop it, not at all costs, but only allowing black to play d5 on under some certain criteria. One of them being the bishop on a2, which justifies to move a3 so that d5 doesn't come with a tempo, and this e-pawn can potentially be pushed to e5 in response. Or, well that's the first criteria, or allowing a, a king side attack in response to a black breaking in the center to try and take advantage of black's negligence of his defense by trying to focus pieces on a d5 break. So this is the setup. We have e6, looking for the d5 break, not yet, but in the future. I go bishop a2, which is a very common move, just preemptively getting ready for d5. It can't happen yet because, like I say, we have too many attackers. Technically, 
black could do this to remove a defender. But then he also trades off his Fienkerto Bishop. And this is looking mighty scary in the future. So, knight g to e7 is the main move. And if the knight goes to f6, you can play bishop g5, pinning the knight to the queen. And potentially forcing black to chase your bishop back like this, which weakens black's king side, and d5 can be met with h4. So, instead, black often put the, puts the knight on e7. So if bishop g5 is played here, it's not quite as good. Because, I mean... Black could play f6, just blocking off the diagonal, but then he blocks his own bishop, and my bishop becomes more powerful as the e6 pawn has lost a defender. But after bishop g5, h6, bishop h4, g5, bishop g3, black is kind of better defended, because if d5 and h4... Knight on f6 isn't vulnerable to any kind of attack, and this bishop remains open. So well, it, it might seem kind of arbitrary, different the difference, but quite simply, if Black Castle's kingside, the knight offers less in terms of defense. Sorry, more in terms of defense even, on e7 rather than f6. On f6 it's vulnerable and it blocks the bishop, but on e7 it can transfer to g6, and play a more active role in the defense. So, the move here is h4, and typically black will respond with h6. By the way, sorry for the massive rant about that, but I hope it was useful at least. Uh, if you've just skipped ahead, then, like, fair enough. Um, <laughs> h6 and h5 are the main moves here. h5 to stop me playing h5, and h6 so that if h5 is played, g5 can be played. The line continues like this, and you break apart the black king side, and I know this theory. Good chance my opponent doesn't know this theory. Because after h4, my opponent castles. And I'm like, okay, what about h5 then? You, you can't push, because I'll take. And if you take, then queen takes, and you're getting mated. So, my opponent responds with d5. Like I said... D5, if black can achieve it, is often met with an attack on the king side, so the, the break in the center isn't that good. I take. Now my opponent can't take and he can't push because I have the intermezzo taking on there or on f7. So my opponent first takes back with the f pawn. If he takes with the h pawn, it's not a massive difference, but it's slightly better for me because I, ha I just have more squares on the h file to access. Whereas taking with the f pawn means that I can't access h8. And maybe it's easier to defend because you might have h6 or h5 in the future. Taking with the f pawn, however, does weaken this diagonal. And if pawns start getting traded off, the e6 pawn is going to lose some support. And the diagonal is just weaker in general because my bishop is one pawn further away from being connected with the king. So, I play bishop h6. The computer doesn't like this, but my point is that I'm just trading the dark squared bishops. This is a great bishop, this wasn't a great bishop, and I'm just trying to take away a defender from the king side. So my opponent goes queen a5. And if I do something like knight f3, I mean, maybe my opponent can do this? But I still don't believe this works, and neither does the computer, because if rook's hanging, this bishop's still powerful, my rook is going to get into the game, my knight's going to get into the game, and what, for the cost of one pawn? That's that's a gambit. This is I, I would take this position for the cost of one pawn any day. And the computer actually thinks rook takes f3 needs to be played for black to try and alleviate some pressure, which is mad. That's when you know the position's good. So instead I just take, because I think it's simpler just to trade 
and then go queen d2. Meaning this isn't a pin anymore on the knight. And my queen is threatening to go to h6 and potentially mate on h7. Or at least drag the king out into the center. So to defend, my opponent plays knight g8. Now, there were better ways to go about this. Well, there's actually only one better way to go about this. And it's h5, which I mentioned was part of the reason for taking on g6 with the f-pawn. To allow a move like h5 to cut the rook's connection off. But this is a tough move to play. Especially ideas of g4 existing. Now you can force the queens off in this particular line. So it's not quite as good. But if d4 isn't a move to trade the queens. Hypothetically. I'm going to force this structure apart with the move g4. And it gets very tricky. So my opponent plays the second best move h5 is so tough to play and he plays knight g8 but this hangs a pawn after takes takes i don't take with the knight and allow a queen trade because i want to attack instead i take with the bishop and i am actually threatening to take this knight potentially and then allow my queen to get in so my opponent goes knight d4 i go knight e2 no need to rush because if I take the knight and then king takes, there's ideas of knight takes c2, but my opponent can also just defend quite easily because the king is no longer on g7, so the move queen h6 doesn't come with a check and then a follow up. And the position, I'm a pawn up, but my attack's kind of fizzled out. So after knight d4, I play knight e2. If my opponent takes, then I'm planning queen takes. This is not a pin because nothing defends the e8 square and I can just take the rook. I'm going to queenside castle and my bishop is very, very strong. I'm going to be able to get my knight to e4 once I queenside castle. Potentially come to g5, get my queen involved. It's a very nice position for white. So my opponent doesn't take. He plays rook e8. And I queenside castle. Here, I offer my opponent a trade of queens. After knight takes e2, I can't take with the queen because that hangs the queen. Knight takes e2, queen takes d2, king or rook takes d2, probably king, protecting the knight. My opponent manages to trade the queens, but I am up a pawn. But this seems like a better version of being up a pawn because my, I'm already castled, so my rooks are connected. My opponent lacks development, and it's tricky to develop this bishop. If he goes somewhere like this, it just hangs the pawn. So you probably have to play that rook b8 first, and then I try and take over the e-file. If you go to a place like f5, knight g3 attacks the bishop. It's very difficult. So my opponent, being a pawn down, opts for bishop e6. I take, rook takes, and then I trade knights. Because again, I'm happy to trade the queens, because I'm a pawn up and I like my position if the queen trade happens. Especially here with such an active knight. My opponent, you know, he's got to try and fight. So trading the queens would essentially be an admission... Ooh. An admission of a long and painful endgame. So he opts for queen b5. Just keeping pressure on my queen side. This effectively loses the game. And the most accurate move in this position is knight g5. Attacking the rook and attacking h7. But I wanted to mate my opponent. So after queen b5, I mix up the move order, mix up change up, I didn't mix it up, I saw both moves, but I thought, I thought this was better, it's more forcing, rook takes h7, check, sacking the rook, my opponent has to take, and then knight g5, king moves, and then I take on e6, now, the reason that rook takes 
the, the, the reason rook takes h to h7 is technically worse than knight g5. It's because after knight g5, I'm going to take on h7 and there's nothing you can do about it. Now in this line, black has queen takes g5. And when I take back, my opponent can double rooks and try and claim that he's going to survive this position. A queen for a rook and a knight. Now that's the only reason it prefers knight g5 first in this position. But who is going to give their queen up? No, no, no one's going to give their queen up for that kind of endgame. So my opponent plays king g7. Now, I was kind of expecting king h8, so that this doesn't come with a check. But here I have rook h1, and I force the king to g7. And it's actually far worse, because, well, actually like this. Because now you're losing the queen by force. So my opponent plays the better move, rook g7. Looks counterintuitive, because this comes with check. But if you went to h8, I was forcing you back anyway. So, and, and you're losing your queen at the end of the line. So knight takes e6, king f7. Admittedly here, I missed knight c7, just with the most obvious fork ever. I instead play rook e1, because my idea is the knight cuts off the king's escape squares back to the shelter of the pawn. So if I play rook e1 and cement my knight in place, then I'm preparing queen f4, check, either forcing knight f6, which is a very flimsy knight because there's no pawns defending it, or forcing the king onto the e-file because its escape route is cut off, and then there's going to be loads of nasty discovered checks. So that was why I went for rook to e1. And again, admittedly I did just miss the obvious knight c7, for whatever reason. So my opponent plays rook c8. He's got to try something. But there's nothing. Queen f4 check. My opponent needs to block with the queen. But I'm happy in this case. Because I get a check in. I, I can probably just, well, I can actually win the d4 pawn first. But even if we trade queens, I'm up, what? two pawns and my king's a lot safer my rook's more active my knight's more active this is an easy end game conversion this just picks up a third pawn as well so i don't mind uh queen f4 queen f5 my opponent can't afford to trade the queens again because i'm up material so knight f6 knight g5 king g7 and like i said before the knight is just far too flimsy because it's only protected by the king. So I have to rook e7, check, king g8. I take the knight on f6. There's so many different checkmates looming. And my opponent resigns in this position because there's no way for him to stop mate without sacrificing all of his material just to prolong it. So that's the game. I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope it's maybe encouraged you to actually give the opening a go because not many people play it to, for, for, for whatever reason and it's a really solid line. Like even if the opponent accepts the gambit which I've covered in other videos you get such a nice position with that big center man. Like it's ridiculous. It's so fun to play. There's so many traps in the opening and as this video demonstrates even if your opponent doesn't accept, you still get you can still get such a nice attacking position, which is exactly the kind of position you want to get if you're an aggressive gambit player like myself. So that's the end of the video. Thank you very much for watching. And like I said, check the playlist out if you want to see more games in this opening. And I'll see you in the next one.